Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast. It's with me, Philip Heidson, and Peter United Chairman and Co owner, Dara McAnthony. So, today we're going to be catching up with Dara on preseason activities. We're going to take a deep dive into the ins and outs of the final salary cap, hopefully for the last time. Uh, we're going to answer some of your questions and then draw the lucky winner of our for, uh, sorry, £500, nearly under, uh, under scored it there, £500 competition. Um, so, Dara, you're now out of quarantine. How's things going back in the UK? Listen, first of all, I take exception to the intro. I'm yeah. not chairman. It's El Presidente. Okay, you i got to stick with the El Presidente. Listen, you know, a deal's a deal. You know what I mean? You've got to get it right. You know, I'm a man of my word. So I've got to ask you this. When do you, so you're going to get promoted and you're going to switch back to chairman. Is that how it's going to work? I'm very superstitious. So if we get promoted, I'll keep the title. All right. be long, live, long live El Presidente. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we're all good. Um, yeah, out of quarantine, sunburnt as anything the other day. I saw a game. Absolutely. I'm, I'm in the heat over here, Philip. You wouldn't believe I miss my yeah. Florida aircon. Yeah. I've, got, I've got these shitty units that you buy all over the house in the UK. Why don't, why don't home builders in the UK put bloody aircon in in new homes? I mean, what the fuck? I understand it's only two, three months a year, but it's just madness to heat. I mean, yesterday, I mean, I, I, I seriously, you've no idea how warm it is here, pal. I'm jealous of that in American aircon, you know, when you walk in and get that relief. Well, I was saying to you off mic, I'm joining you in spirit over here. So I'm in the middle of Texas uh, in a hotel room recording, turning the AC off because of the noise. And so if I start, if anyone's watching, we managed to get this on video and they start seeing us both sweating like buckets, that's our excuse. <laughs> Only you could travel 2,800 miles by car from Florida across the Americas all the way to your destination, California. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, which surprised me. You're a bit of a lid. I mm -hmm. thought you'd be, you know, you'd be frightened of that trip you know what i mean catching coronavirus and worrying about it all and whatever so I'm, I'm i'm amazed you've taken that trip yeah we decided that we were safer to take the joe biden bumper sticker off the back of the car you know as we're driving through some of these states here but maybe by the time we get back into california we'll feel safe again you're the only person i've ever met that lives around me in windermere that has a joe biden bumper sticker yeah. <laughs> you know i got it always you know, as you can see with being a Bradford supporter, you know, I had a choice of, in my family, being a Bradford fan or a Liverpool fan, chose Bradford. I've always been one for the underdog, so. Yeah. Liverpool all the way, baby. Well, I'll say Liverpool are number two, and, um, you know, so they're still, I'm always looking, although, as I said to you on Twitter the other day, who knew that at this point I'd be watching preseason Peterborough United games on uh, highlights, so, you know? It's great. I mean, I, some of the fans are a bit angry we're charging, but... The, the streaming guys that I've always paid to do our games, particularly for my partners in Canada, who sometimes can't get to the UK as much as me, they approached me because I said, look, I need all the games streamed during the summer. Mm -hmm. And they approached me and said, look, we can do it. And we can do it for fans, but we've got to charge. And they've obviously got to make an income. Yeah. Hence, I can't do it for free. I said, you know, some, some of the season ticket holders were a little bit like, well, you know, what about us? I was like, listen, we're going to look after you during the season. This is just pre-season. Usually you'd pay a 10 or a 15 quid a game. So for five quid for a family, a household, if there's three or four of you on average, it's a quid a person to watch the games. So it just gives you a chance to watch some football. It's been yeah, I would love if we did that. You know, just yeah, any, great. you know, I'm sure we'll get into iPlayer in a future episode, right. but, you know, as an expat, you see when some of the games are run in the UK and people are complaining about, oh, the quality is bad because they're basically expecting to watch it like it's on Sky or something. When you're an expat, well, you know, iPlay has been a godsend. It's come a long way. Um, you know, eight, nine years ago in America, I used to pay three grand a game, and it would involve a guy driving up with a van on my driveway with a satellite dish. Mm -hmm. At my office on a Tuesday, Saturday at my house, he'd roll a wire, a cable that was like 300 feet, either up to my office or to my house, he'd plug it into the TV, and I, that was how I got my games. And that was three grand sterling a wow. game. I used to pay to watch like 35 games a year. Yeah. But to get to the point where I can pay, like, well, I get it for free on iFollow, but most people pay, what, a tenner? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, like a season I'm, ticket for me is 150 quid, something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not complaining. So at the end of the day, any way you can watch your team. The one thing I love living in America is, particularly with the Premier League, you can watch every game. Yeah. Like, you can't do that. And, and when I'm in the States on a Saturday and a Sunday, my missus doesn't see me, and I call it work, of course. And she's like, how the fuck watching Liverpool has worked to do with Peter B United? Is if, is if you're going to sign any of their players? I'm like, hang on a second. Some of them could be released down the line. This, this, is, this is due diligence. That's why I'm watching all the Premier League games on a Saturday and Sunday morning. <laughs> well, I'm still having to try and uh, negotiate with the kids to allow <laughs> me to do the same. You know, before they came along, I'm sure I got to watch a lot more. But, you know, our sacrosanct has been able to watch the City games. So 
home and away, <laughs> still watching City on iPlayer every week. Good for you. I love it. Real fan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you, do you fancy Bradford's chances? Do you like what they've done so far? Oh, you know, I'm, I mean, I think we're going to come into the season saying uh, with a lot of who knows because you don't really know what the teams around us are going to be like and how much they're going to struggle, especially in League Two. You look sure. at teams like... Um, Bolton, who are, um, you know, they're signing a few players. We've been pretty quiet in the market so far. They signed like 18 players or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, managed to sneak them all in before the salary cap. Yeah. Um, you know, we, at the end of the day, we've got a strong squad for the division okay. that we're in. Um, yeah. And we have a, you know, we've got a manager who likes attacking football. Uh-huh. Um, we've got some gaps that need to be filled. But, I mean, if we're not challenging... I have to uh, sometimes I have to take my hat off and be realistic and say, you know, just because we're Bradford in that division, we don't deserve we, there's no God given right to deserve to be at the top of the division just because, you know, you have more fans or you're a so called bigger club or all those well, you're, kind you're of things. You're a giant of a club in League Two and, and, yeah. and sometimes the mindset it does work. Like I remember playing Bradford in League One and going to their stadium and always thinking like when we nicked the results, Jesus, what a great result. It's Bradford, look at the stadium, look at the mm-hmm. fans. I mean you always thought even Peter Brown, we probably always spent more than you. I still yeah. came away thinking, fucking what a great result that was, beating Bradford at Bradford. So mm-hmm. uh, when, you, when you're a club with history, steeped in history, and you've been in the Premier League, and you're a big club with a big fan base, you're always going to carry the intimidation factor a little bit. Um, hence why clubs like yours eventually yeah. get out of those leagues and rise. Now, it's interesting you say about intimidation. I mean, do you feel that it inspires as well when you, you know, you're going to a ground like Valley Parade versus, especially if you're a League Two side, you know, and no disrespect to the grounds that are in League Two. Well, sure. you roll up at Valley Parade, and it's different than most of the grounds that you're going to be playing at. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we've used it as an excuse, I think. So I'm interested if being on the other side, if it's if it's reality. I, I think our players would think that way. You know, like, oh, it's a scalp. You know, it's like mm-hmm. if we go to Portsmouth and we beat Portsmouth, that's a big scalp. Even though we fancy ourselves as a favourite for the league, yeah. we still think, well, that's a scalp. Um, me, personally, as an owner, you're always nervous no matter what. So when you suddenly go to a bigger club, you automatically think, 15 years ago, the arrogance in me when we went to smaller clubs, well, we're going to go batter them. Yeah. And after getting our asses handed to us in places like Macclesfield and Akron and Stanley, you're brought down third very quickly. Yeah. So, you, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, at the end of the day. So that's football. And the longer you stay there, the harder it is. Like last time we came down, we were six or seven years. It felt like an eternity. Um, and the first year you have the arrogance. The second year you realize it's going to be a little bit harder. And, you know, for us, I mean, we were teetering on going out of the league completely for a couple of years there um, until we basically we had a game that was uh, a huge fight against uh, your old mate Steve Evans's Crawley um, where there were uh, I mean you know his antics on the sideline obviously um, I think it was a draw or maybe they beat us but there was basically five red cards or six red cards after oh. the final whistle never um, which you know, <laughs> goalkeeper got a three match ban i sent a half got a three match ban you know we're here like five games before the end of the season about to go down oh, but that really galvanized everybody um yeah. and you know you start it's just that change in momentum and uh, from there uh, we started just going up again that's a great story and you know? i love all the red cards. look the reality i say to all football fans who have a club that's teetering on collapse or could fall out of the league you've got two stories you got bournemouth and you got luton mm-hmm. bournemouth didn't go down but they all went all the way to the top Luton went down and were in no man's land for like four or five years in non-league. And look at Luton now. They're a really well-run football club. They're a championship club. They're one league away from the biggest league in the world. Yeah. But if you'd, ask, if you'd ask their fans eight, nine years ago, they'd have gone, you're fucking bonkers. Right. So that is your hope as a football fan that it's there. There's always hope in football. Now, we had a, it's, it's a great point. There's always hope because, I mean, without hope, it can, be, it can seem pretty depressing. Uh, sure. At times, but I actually I'm going to jump all the way to a listener question that um, that I got from Chris Ward because it's really relative to what, and relevant to what you just said. You okay. know, can a self sufficient trust run club ever become a Premier League or even a successful Championship club without outside investment? So, can you self generate the funds to do, you know, what Luton have done or uh, to get on the brink of the Premier League, or do you really need big influxes of capital to do that? Hard truth. Mm-hmm. No chance. Yeah. No fucking chance. So, um, look, fairy tale wise, you'd love that to happen. No chance. You look at Newport, you look at AFC Wimbledon, um, who've done phenomenal. But AFC Wimbledon are a bit different. They've got some big, heavy, heavy, heavy wealthy hitters behind there in yeah. the fan group that, that own a percentage of the club. And when they get their new stadium, maybe. Um, you know, Wickham were owned by the fans, but they were taken over by a wealthy American who plowed in a couple of million and got them promoted. So without him, they probably wouldn't have gone up. 
you go all the way to Exeter, which is like, again, fan run, I believe. Julian does a brilliant job there at Exeter running the place. But again, you look at Exeter, they will go League One, League Two, create players from their academy that have been sold for millions. Watkins will be the next one. Mm -hmm. They'll probably get four million in a sell on from Watkins, which will be put back in their academy, keep the club sustainable. I'm not sure you can get to the championship. You might get one lucky season, but then you might do a Yeovil where you go up and then go down two or three times. Yeah. So I, I just don't think a fan owned club, and I've dealt with a few of them when it comes to transfers and whatever else. I don't think it will ever work for the champ of the Prem. I think League One, League Two, comfortable. Mm -hmm. Above that, no fucking way. All right. Well, there's the hard truth this week. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, League One seems to be fairly quiet so far on the transfer front, at least from what I've observed from afar. Are you starting to see things move a little bit yet, or are we still in that period where teams are still figuring out what's going on? I, I, I think what's happened is a lot of clubs have come back later. And they're starting to come back now. We've been back, obviously, a few weeks. Yeah. Um, we've been quite passive about our business. I think we've done two today. Um, you know, they'll be announced later. Mm -hmm. we're, very, we're very methodical this summer about those four or five pieces we just want to get done. There's no rush. There's no panic. Some of that business might take a bit longer. And that's fine. Yeah. Because what you've got is players will come back pre-season. Their clubs will want to see them. And the clubs don't want them. Then you do the deals for them. Bristol Rovers have done some good business in our league. Um, who else in there? Um, Burton have signed a couple of experienced good players. There hasn't been standout big signings in our league. Mm -hmm. I know Charlton are trying to do a couple of deals, but they were stopped because of the, the ownership issue. Yeah. Um, league Two, obviously, Bolton have turned into, you know, it's like Steve Evans is running the club. They signed like... <laughs> yeah. right. um, and I love Steve, by the way, so it's not a dig. It's just he likes to sign a player. Um, you got a lot of clubs, you know, Champ and Prem, who are probably going to be a bit later when they come back. You're probably going to see a big rush on and the fact the window's open until October, yeah. you probably see a lot more business the last two weeks in September. Because, And this is why I argued about keeping windows open longer. It gives the manager a chance to start the season with the squad and then by the end of September say, well, do we need two or three mm -hmm. signings? Did, did I get this wrong? Did I miss this? Did I miss that? Um, and obviously then you've got the salary cap and people are trying to adjust and make sure the figures work. Um, so uh, there's going to be more deals done. But, you know, Fleet would sign a couple of good players as well. So, so far, it's been a trickle. Uh, I don't think the tap will turn on probably for another few weeks. Okay. Now, the big question in the transfer market for you at the moment is uh, Ivan Tony. And, you know, there's obviously rumors all the time on Twitter. And, you know, every journalist left, right and center claims to know that, you know, he's been sold for a pound to, you know, you name your club. Um, what's going on with Ivan Tony? It's really frustrating. I, I, there were a lot of fans, and I love the way fans come on your Twitter feed and tell you the value of your players. <laughs> I, I Celtic fans saying, you shouldn't be charging that much for a League One player, yet they want that League One player. Um, you then have, I think it was Derby and Forest fans who I get on quite well with. You know, there was an article done in the paper there. I don't know where that came from. And it wasn't me, trust me, um, because there's obviously a lot of Premier League clubs trying to buy them. And they were quoting $5 million. We We agreed a deal a lot more than $5 million for Ivan Tony. Yeah. And as proof, I've shown you that yeah. to verify yeah. that the deal was a lot more than the $5 million that was quoted. Um, and he was given permission to talk. Um, so far, nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. There are other clubs negotiating to buy him. So we know one, obviously, a big one that's been mentioned, which isn't in, the U in England. Yeah. Uh, there are Premier League clubs who are having recruitment meetings this week who are now starting to join the party. And there are usual players from the championship who are inquiring and taking the mick. So we're very comfortable about it. I've got two partners who are very wealthy, so I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and this joke on Twitter that, you know, he's not worth this, he's not worth that, he's worth to us what we feel he's worth. Yep. And if, if that means in the end we say, well, he's going to play the year out with us um, and we win promotion, happy days, no problem. Yeah. So we do our transfer business again methodically. Uh, you know me, everyone knows me and, and Baza, Barry Fry. We don't have our pants pulled down. Uh, we're like the Mounties. We always get our man and we always get the figure for our man mm -hmm. when we want to sell. So if people want to do business, you know, of course, we've said to the player he can he can go for the right money. That was our agreement with him last January when we turned down multiple bids. So and, and I've stuck to my word on that. Hence why I negotiated a deal two weeks ago for him. Yeah. And, gave him permission. and I stuck to my word. And then it's up to the player and his agents and his dad and whatever to to do that. But right now he's with us and posh fans might even see him play this Saturday. Um, uh, so yeah very interesting so we're very relaxed about it my manager would be like well listen the quicker it's done the better i can get on with things well yeah but he doesn't pay the bills yeah so i understand where he's coming from but unfortunately again he doesn't pay the bills those decisions are obviously made by myself i run the football side 
my partners are very supportive of that. So if I make the decision, those deals aren't the right deals for us. He's not going to that other club and we should keep him for, for the, you know, the next year. My partners will back that. So again, very relaxed. Yeah. That's the Ivory saga. I, I, Alan Swan will be bursting a blood vessel listening <laughs> to this. As we speak, trying to get an article out right now during the night listening to this. Uh, so, sorry. so I imagine you've got a couple of folks lined up or, you know, priorities, let's say, plan A, sure. plan B, plan C as well, if, if and when the dominoes kind of fall. Now, is your recruitment waiting for the transfer to happen or is, um, you know, other things just, are they all dependent upon Ivan Tony going? No, we, we've, we've tried to uh, buy a player, a specific type player. Wasn't really reliant on Ivan going or staying. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the club we're buying off think we've got Brewster's billions coming because they've read all the articles and headlines. They don't realise that in football, there's, there's last year's budget to pay for. That was yeah. a disaster because of the end of the season. There's all the financial issues coming up. Um, and whilst my partners will back me in not selling them, if we do sell them, of course the money's taken care of and has to replenish and, and look after the club. And we don't want to lose any staff like what you've seen at Arsenal. Yeah. Um, we're trying to keep everyone together at our football club and we have a salary cap. So the club we're trying to buy off are, are quoting us figures. You know, some would say, I go on about ridiculous figures for Ivan Tony. Well, you know, f for the player we were trying to get, the, the figures quoted, you know, okay, I had to have a smirk <laughs> and I understand why they did it. But, you know, we, we've got ABC. I'm very relaxed. Everyone has a price, and I'm not going to begrudge anyone asking for a big dough for their player. We do the same. Um, we move on to someone else. That's just what we do. Um, we're in a good place. We've got some really, really good attacking players. We had on Saturday, we had um, you know, young Ricky J. Jones at 17. He was electric again. His strike partner from the U team, Brad, was played in a preseason friendly and scored a hat trick. Mm -hmm. We've got some really good attacking, striking talent at the football club, not to mention the first teamers that are there already. So, yeah, pretty relaxed about it. All right. We'll, we'll just watch this space then. Sure. So um, let's go into the salary cap. And uh, cool. I know we talked about it probably the first time you and I did a did the podcast together. We went a little bit of a deep dive and everything kind of changed. Um, it got voted through earlier, well, last week as we're recording this. And so what I thought I would do is kind of summarize my understanding of all the different elements of the cap. And then let's just have a chat about some questions that I have related to it. So here's my, and I, if anyone, if we're managing to get this out on video this week, depending on our uh, the tech situation uh, here in the hotel, um, we'll be able to see me reading as I'm uh, talking right now. So we basically have two and a half million pounds for League One, one and a half million pounds for League Two. That's kind of well been reported. Uh, the cap includes all players over 21, but you can have an unlimited number of players that are 21 and under that just don't count in any way, shape or form towards the cap. Um, the amounts, um, those amounts include all player related payments. So bonuses, taxes, agents, image rights, everything with the exception of any cup and promotion bonuses. So those don't count. Um, any contract that's signed before July 29th can be capped at the league average for the duration of the contract. So what's that? Probably a week and a half, 10 days or so ago. Um, the exception is that players under 24 can extend and still count towards the average as long as the extension isn't a higher salary. So you have a, a young player, 23 years old, you want to give them a four-year extension, same wage, that can count still towards the, uh, at the league average. Um, for, and thanks for bearing with us here. There's a few points to go through. Um, <laughs> any you, need be, you need to be a scientist to get this right, by the way. I know, <laughs> right? That was what my day yesterday was spent trying to figure out while we're driving. Um, <laughs> any club relegated uh, can count salaries for all players registered by the end of the winter transfer window of the season that they're relegated. So basically anyone who came down this year, last year's salary is up to the, uh, for the players are registered uh, by the end of the winter transfer window can count at the league average. So you have, um, let's say, Wigan coming down. All their salaries are championship salaries. Everyone who's registered by Christmas in the year they get relegated, they can just stick those in for the length of the contract at the average. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? So uh, 22 squad players maximum in that 21 and over bucket uh, for next season, and then it's 20 thereafter. Um, and eight of those players have to be homegrown which is a player who spent three or more years before the age of 21 at a football league, an FA, FA of Wales affiliated club. So it's not necessarily related to those, um, uh, what they call them, the, um, the players that you bring up through your system. Um, youth graduates, academy yeah. graduates. 
Yeah, so it's not those, it's just they've got to be in the FA system, the EFL system for three years. Sure. Um, injuries. This year, if you have someone injured that's long term, you can apply to get, take them out of the cap. If they get injured next season, well, not next season, the season after next, tough. You're stuck with it. Um, and so breaches is the last thing to talk about. So over five, if you're 5% over the, the cap, you pay a tax up to three pounds for every pound over. Uh, then if uh, you go above that, there's a transfer embargo and you've got to go to the EFL with a plan of how you're going to bring it back under, uh, under the salary cap number. If you don't do that, then, you know, you're in trouble. Um, and it's subject to, uh, which I always love, subject to disciplinary commission, which means they can do what they want. But the guideline is essentially 15 points unless you're going for promotion. You know, you win in the league by 30 points and you're 45 points off the playoffs then uh, you're going to get a 45 point deduction. <laughs> so whatever they need to give you to stop you getting in the playoffs, essentially. Um, yeah, you, you summed it up pretty well there. Yeah, last but not least, I have a final bullet point here. Increases, they're going to be pegged to any broadcast deal revenues. So let's say the AFL gets a big deal with Sky or an increase in their deal with Sky, increases 10%, the revenue for the clubs, then the cap will increase by 10%. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. basically what I got. So, what do you make of all of that then? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a minefield, a bit of a minefield. Fair. Um, it, it went through on Friday. I think it was the vote. My partners were on the call. Out of the three of us, two of us were on board. One of us was like, kind of like, Neh. and what, you know, but that's fine. We don't always agree on things. Mm -hmm. um, I was for it. A lot of people were surprised I was for it. Um, I was for it because there were so many people moaning about finishing the season and spending three, four hundred grand. So I thought, well, fine, if the majority can't afford to finish the season, well, then the majority need to get their wages in order. Yeah. And that was always my thought process. And I think it needs to be brought in, and then it'll stop football clubs going out of business, and it'll it'll stop it being the Wild West. It'll make agents have a reality check. You've got the PFA already crying like a bunch of babies over it. Yeah, we'll uh, get to that in a minute. You know, we, we've hardly heard from the PFA since the pandemic started. Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing loud and clear from the megaphone. So, again, the, the hypocrisy is not lost on me. Um, <coughs> for us... I had to do a whole model with my finance director. So she had to send me the whole thing. And I had to work out, it was like a chess game. I was working out moves mm -hmm. and keep it. How do we do this and how do we do that? Sat with a manager on Saturday before the game. I said, look, to get those players, to get them, we're going to have to take these out. Because you're, what you're also, you missed there is you're allowed to take people out. Okay. So for example, if we've got two people at our club who we want to move on, yeah. we, take them, we might be paying their wages, but we yeah. take them out. Just They're because. not registered anymore. Which makes it easier when we tell those players, look guys, you know, in previous seasons, they think, oh, I've got a chance, so I'll stay and I'll play. But when you say to them, you're actually not in the squad, you cannot play. If they want to play football, they've got to go and find a club. You know, yes, you're paying the wage, it's fine. But they need to go and find a deal and go and find a club. So we've taken a, we've taken a couple out. You know, we're, we're pretty much, we get the players we want, we make the moves we want, we're, we're right at the top of it. Mm. So even for us. And we've got, I think, 11 players under 21. So we've got a great batch of youngsters and um, what I say comes down to over the next three, four, five years, where this is, you know, finding its way through, is who recruits the best. Yeah. And I always fancy my chances against anyone. Yeah. I don't care if it's Liverpool in our league. You know, I fancy my chances that I can recruit, which I've done for 15 years really well. And I quite like the similarity to America. I've always pushed for the NFL type system, mm -hmm. the way they have salary cap and the budgets and everything else, and that player in and that player out. I think it's going to work great for football. There's going to be a lot of kicking and screaming. There's going to be a lot of uh, moaning about it. There's going to be lawsuits. There's going to be all sorts. But if we want our teams to be able to play full seasons in pandemics and people not feigning, not having money and financial issues and getting things under control, giving a reality check to agents, to players about League One and League Two, and I said this two weeks ago, the days of big paydays and those leagues yeah. are gone. You know, you've got an hour and you're, you're moved to the champ and above to get paid. This is the new world we're living in, and, and fuck, booah, we've got to get on board with it, and, and that's what I'm going to do. Now, what obviously it didn't pass unanimously. Um, I think it was closer to unanimous in League Two than it was League One, but there were still a couple of dissenters, including Bradford. Um, sure. You know, personally, I'm for it, um, and probably that's with you know my business finance kind of hat on. Um, but you know, you hear clubs groaning, whinging, moaning about it. Am I missing anything? Like, why are they complaining? No, I, I appreciate why they're, why they're complaining. I, I have a great relationship with a Portsmouth CEO, you know, Mark, Mark Hatton, and we were emailing about it. And he probably got the hump with me because obviously I didn't vote that way. Yeah. 
but, but that's fine because you know we're very transparent with each other and i understand his perspective he has a club that gets 15 20 000 people they run a really well run ship under the eisners they've got no financial issues whatsoever mm -hmm. and he feels they're getting punished and he feels they've probably got players now and they're looking at it and going shit we've got a year maximum to get this in order and now this stops us trying to get out of league one so as i said to him i'd love both of our clubs to get out of league once so we don't have necessarily that issue yeah. you've then got uh, sunderland and a friend of mine runs that jim rodwell and he's got the same problems you've got ipswich these are big clubs with big crowds so you can understand where they're coming from they want to be judged on turnover so if they've got fans who are generating eight nine ten million more than peterborough they want to be able to spend that mm -hmm. uh, that's where my original idea was based on turnover not like the current thing we have before the salary cap came in but a fixed turnover amount of if we turn over five million we can spend two and a half if we turn over seven we can spend three turn over 10 and that, that gives a little bit of a leeway for the bigger clubs and that's probably what we should have done yeah the other thing i disagree with is if we sell ivan tony for mega mega money yeah. that doesn't count you can't reinvest that back into the first team instead of rewarding us as a football club yeah. for doing business the right way and being self-sustainable we're getting punished so yeah we can we can invest in our pitch our stadium our youth but we can't invest in the squad yet ivan came from that squad mm. and for player trading so that's probably a bit of a frustration too because you really want to see, you want to encourage player trading. Yeah. Uh, if that was allowed, you'd see a lot more player, because player trading gives clubs lifelines. And that's why I would have had that in there. So I empathize with the clubs who are angry about it, but this is the new world. This is where we are. So we're going to have to basically put our big girl pants on and get on with it. You know, I certainly understand from, you know, generating football income from transfers, from cup runs, you know, being able to, because that's for, for Bradford, that's how we went on our, our runs mm -hmm. over the last few years was putting money back in from players that we sold and from cup runs because we had some really good cup runs. Um, but, you know, when I take a step back, um, it's just about how you invest the money. So now you're not going to be able to invest the money in a, um, a, a wage, but the salary cap is going to create a ceiling of what wages are anyway. Um, so you're still going to be fighting for the same talent. It's not going to be different talent you're fighting for. So how are you spending that money is going to be, to, to, to have the infrastructure which one allows you to find those who are the better players and two be more attractive to the better players because of all the other things and surroundings and everything that you can give them so you're still investing it back in you're just investing in something different than you were before so we, we saw this coming a while ago and my partner Jason is big into the youth and he always wanted to go the category so we've just been pre-accepted for cat mm -hmm. two on our youth we have to follow through with protocols and put certain things in and we get cat two status which is massive for us um, and that's going to help us get better talent at our academy and bring it through. The fact that talent doesn't count until they're a certain age means the, the ones who run good academies are going to basically prosper. Yeah. And that's really important as well. Um, for example, we just sold a 13-year-old goalkeeper for over 150 grand to a Premier League club. Mm -hmm. If it had gone to a tribunal, we would have got a lot less. We'd managed to get a deal and get a better deal. If we were a cat too, we would have got a lot more money from it. So, you know, they're the things now football clubs have to be creative. And they have to run really good academies. And we've put an infrastructure in place where our academy is going to be over the next couple of years, second to none, uh, and, and hopefully put us in a really good place. So by the time we get back to the champ, we've got these youngsters coming off the yeah. line that are going into the squad. So let's say you've a squad of 22 or 23. You know, you've got half of that as your academy and younger players and half of that as your, your players over 21 that you're paying the bigger wages to. Mm -hmm. So you just have to, I love the creativity of it, that you have to take your pen, you've got to take your calculator, and you got to work it out. I like it. It comes down to recruiting. And I love recruiting. So all those clubs out there, you know, buckle up. Recruit better. Well, it takes away the, I mean, it seems to me a lazy option sometimes. They've all just gone buy another player. Um, and it, it takes away that option because it's, it goes right. to long-term thinking rather than short-term thinking. Correct. You can't buy your way out of a problem anymore. No, absolutely. You, you, you couldn't have somebody come in and spend $28 million or $30 million in League One and blow everyone away. Yeah. No, it's got to be a bit more fair, fair fit. Um, so I'm happy. I embrace that. Um, look, the club's coming down. They've got an opportunity. You know, Hull, um, I forget who else came down there. My mind's Wigan, gone. Um, Wigan. Wigan. Um, who else was it? Who's the third one? Why can't I remember? Charlton. Charlton. Yeah, that's the one. Well, look, you know, Hull have got the bigger advantage out of those three because they haven't got all field issues, not yeah. massive field issues. So you'd like to think they're probably in a really, really good place. And they've stood by their managers. So fair play to them. So... You would imagine the Hull would be instant favourites for the League One title. So, um, does this make a club less attractive as an investment proposition? 
No. You know, does it devalue a club? Does it increase the value of clubs that are well run? I mean, I, I you know, it's, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Nobody would ever thought I'd get, you know, uh, eight figures f- for Peter B United valuation wise when I sold half the club. Mm-hmm. Everyone was like, you never sell a League One club, whatever else. Look what I did. Yeah. So again, at the end of the day, it comes down to what's someone buying into a club? My partners were buying into a club with a great recruitment history, a club with a value, a squad that has a massive value. People always laugh when I go on about our squad value. But when you take just one player along, right. you, you know, That's like more than t- most League One and League Two teams. Right, right. And then we have another two players that we've had bids off champ clubs on yeah. that would even put that further up. So you're talking about just in players alone, we have over 20 million worth of assets. We have no debt except mm-hmm. to the owners. You know, we're, we're buying our stadium. So for anyone buying a once a really well run football club an hour from London, that's why Peter United is attractive. Bradford's an attractive proposition. You know, if, you, if there's no debt anymore and they've got rid of all the crap that was there before, you're buying a sleeping giant, you're buying a fan base. What price would you put on that? So it just depends. But I don't see the salary cap affecting prices okay. one way. Um, my last question here is, do you think this creates a bigger gap between League One and the Championship? Yes. Yes. We need to get in the champ. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'd say is I wish the champ had done a salary cap. Uh, that needs to happen. Is it um, coming, do you think? I hope so. Because I think the amount of clubs that are about to do stadium deals and get themselves in trouble, um, you know, it has to come. When you see some of these clubs have lost 30 million over three years or more, um, it's catastrophic. So I think it has to come. And what you've seen this year with Wigan, you know, Charlton, other clubs in the champ, this is the second biggest, one of the second biggest leagues in Europe. Mm-hmm. So I'd like a cap in the champ. I'm not sure the clubs in there would like that. Um, but let's see. Let's see what the appetite's like. Let's see how it goes for us. But there's definitely a bigger gap. We've got to get out of this league. So why... Why um, why was the championship not included in the League One and League Two cap then? You know, why didn't the EFL say this is EFL wide? Is it just there's so much contention about doing it in the champ that yeah, it was easier to do in League One and League Two? It was easier to do League One and League Two. If you put it to an overall vote with the champ, we would have lost. Mm-hmm. So that's why it was kind of separated. Now, I don't know what the discussions are, or the chats are going forward, but my God, the PFA would burst a blood vessel if the championship did a, a, you know, a salary cap. That's for sure. Well, that, that's a nice segue into the last thing I had on this. So we're going through, you know, we've been talking about the salary cap for a couple of months, I think, as a, uh, an EFL and PFA is quiet, which is not usually their default situation. They usually, you know, let you know about any, everything all the time. And then the last minute, surprise, surprise, they turn up uh, throwing all the toys out of the pram. So where's that going? If, you, if you're a betting man, where's that going? I've been saying it for months. The PFA needed to be in, involved. They needed to engage more. I know there were conversations, but it wasn't enough. The command were advising, oh, yeah, you can do pay deferrals, you can do this, do that. But they needed to get all their members together and go, we need to do a pay cut. We need to do a pay cut with what's happened with the pandemic. Clubs need a pay cut. There's too many unemployed footballers this summer. I'm seeing it every day. I get 20 players every day sent to me. Players who've got no contracts. Players that were on two, three, four grand a week last year, if you're lucky to get a grand a week this year. Mm-hmm. You know, PFA, they're not doing their job for their members. They might be looking after the higher echelon, yeah. but let's not forget, it's not just Premier League players, it's not just championship players. There's thousands of players below that. The, and those are arguably the players who need the PFA more. Yeah, the most. more. Absolutely. These are people who need the PFA support, don't earn life-changing money, need to have second careers when they finish, you know, ne- you know, and probably don't have the qualifications to go and get other careers. You know, We signed a kid the other day, and we, I think we announced it today, and I met with his dad on Saturday and said, look, he's got to finish school. We insist all players under a certain age get their qualifications mm-hmm. because you don't know what's going to happen in football. It's a short career. Anything can happen. And look, the PFA is good in one set for players. It looks after them in one way. But in this way, it's been really short-sighted about it. And I'm really, really disappointed. They don't like me saying that. I'm probably an enemy of the PFA for saying what I'm saying. But instead of kicking a fuss and screaming and shouting about salary caps, they should have gone to all their members and said, look, guys, let's get a pay cut across the board. Let's all go to all the clubs. Let's fix a 20%, 25% pay cut with incentives going up for clubs um, for the next 24 months. Mm-hmm. We have to change with the times. Football clubs don't have crowns. And when they do have crowns, they're going to be down 70% on crowns probably for a while. The players have to understand that. You know, they're human beings. They can't just be, look at what's happening at Arsenal. You don't want normal people at football clubs losing their jobs because right. players are using to take a pay cut. Yeah, it's like getting huge bonuses. Hard. It's morally wrong. Yeah. So, you know, the PFA had a chance to really lead in this and stand out in front and go, you know what, guys, not only to help clubs, but also to help all the unemployed footballers, 
Let's bring things in line for a couple of years. It's a couple of years. That's what it's going to be for recovery. Let's just get it done. And let's go out publicly, hand in hand with the EFL, hand in hand with everyone, and go, this is what we've done. This is what we're going to do. And by the way, we're also going to throw a bit of money in for testing. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to help out. But no, it's it's crickets until it's not crickets. Yeah. And suddenly, ooh, there's a salary cap coming in. Players can't charge what they want anymore. We're going to kick up a fuss and we're going to get legal. Yeah. Get to fuck. Get to fuck. Yeah, you know, it's just they're being so reactive rather than proactive in all this. And, you know, from an outsider's perspective, it's been in really interesting following things over the pandemic and, you know, all this talk about we're all in this together and the football family and all, you know, you hear this till the cows come home when there was no football going on. But then when money gets to be involved, um, it's every man for themselves again. And, um, you know, I guess that's kind of what we're seeing here from the PFA and how they respond. Money, money talks and bullshit walks. Mm -hmm. um, I said to you last week, every, you know, we're all in the same storm. We're in different boats. Yeah. And the PFA is definitely in a different boat. <laughs> all right. Well, let's leave it at that. We're going to go into a short break. I have a couple of listener Q&As and then we will wrap up with news of our, this week's competition winner. Sounds good. All right. Be back soon. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hard Truth Podcast. I'm here with Dara and I have a couple of listener questions. The first one actually that I was going to ask we covered earlier. So I'm going to go straight into a question here that I have from Jonathan Holmes. And Jonathan asks, before you sign a player, how many times would you actually watch them in a live game? Live game, um, probably four times live, probably another two times online. Um, you know, there'll be quite a bit of analysis and data going on behind that. Um, it will be from my scout that work for me. We'll go see them, to me seeing them, to then the manager, and then Barry Fry seeing them. Mm -hmm. So very rare. We have done it occasionally if we've taken a punt without seeing them. Yeah. But you know, most of the time, the big ones that we've got right that have gone on for Mega Dough, we've seen them. Um, so yeah, that that's really there's like I said, there's a bit of a science to it. Yeah. And what we do, and I, I have like a thing here that I just tick a lot of boxes on. And I also have like a thing of one to 10 where the players have to be over seven out of 10 mm -hmm. on 90% of the things I have. And if they're not, we move on. Okay. So it's something I've, I've built many years ago when it comes to signing players um, specifically. So I'm not going to go into too much more, but that's yeah. it, yeah. And you, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because you talk about data and analytics so much. And, sure. you know, that can sometimes be a, you can look at that and not look at what that means in real life. You know, you end up buying a bunch of, players that have the the stats but they don't necessarily have you haven't seen them so it's interesting to hear that you're still going and seeing them all the time and marrying the two together 100 percent, it's so important and we live in a modern world now technology takes place in football more than ever you know saturday when i was with the manager we had the big screen we paid for up with all the data stuff that we have from us you know the scouting system and whatever and go right mm -hmm. that player that player footage bits and pieces. We already know the backgrounds of the players. We've done our research and due diligence. So that analytics is a massive part of the game. If you're not on board with it, you're going to get left behind. Now, do you think that that's a differentiator for you guys versus, you know, I I hear of other clubs talking about, well, you know, we can watch them in Y Scout um, and we see them there and, you know, we're kind of good to go. We don't need to see them in the flesh anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more difficult now with a pandemic where you probably not have got sense scout to a game. So I don't know how that changed over the next couple of months now that testing has been relaxed and stuff. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think it's really important. Um, and anyone who just wants to do business using Scout, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You know, you really want to get things right. So, um, but there's no, I always say this, there's no perfect science. But the one thing you've got to go with is you've got to, you've got to have a good, a good instinct and you've got to have stones when you bring players mm -hmm. in. You've got to take some calculated risks and gambles. Some clubs won't do that. We yeah. will always do it. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Alex, which is an interesting one. So in a contract negotiation with a new or existing player, what's the most outrageous thing that the club has been asked for? You got any interesting stories about crazy asks from players or potential players? Over the years, we've had a few. We had one where he wanted like 12 flights a year for him and his family mm -hmm. to come and see him, come from abroad. We had another one where they wanted a parent put on the payroll of the club. Um, another one where... We had to pay um, his lawyer's fees for his divorce with his wife. Right. Uh, um, what else have we had? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, many times I've had to help players out, even current players, you know, with lawyers I have and yeah. different things. We had another player years ago to do with gambling debts. You know, so there's, there's, there is a few quirky ones. From an agent perspective, the agent sometimes will want 
a percentage of the player transfer, and it's a hard fucking truth no for me yeah. every time. I'm not giving an agent or a player a, a dollar on, on what we sell a player for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. But some clubs do that. Yeah, which I guess gives them is why they ask. Mm-hmm. You don't ask, you don't get. Uh, Love that saying. <laughs> um, I got a question from Benjamin Beebe here, and Benjamin asks, have you ever thought about doing something like a posh till I die uh, series like Sunderland did on Netflix? You know, basically opening the cameras, bringing them behind the scenes and um, airing it all, what's and all. I got offered like money for the sequel to Big Ron from another company. A friend of mine who works like in BT and has quite a media presence in the company a few years ago offered me, way before all the Netflix stuff came yeah. out, offered us dough. Um, watch this space. All right. See what's coming down the pipe then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, all right, let me see. I'm just going to see if there's any other uh, questions that we've, we have lots of questions that we um, have coming in that I obviously want to add to um, sure. future episodes. So I'm just looking at some of our old questions here. Um, here's an interesting one. Have you ever gone into the dressing room at halftime? This is from Bobby uh, Madison. On my children's life, never. Mm-hmm. It used to be written shit like that about me all the time. You can ask any, even the managers who don't like me. We always tell you, I've got no interest in being in the dressing room. I got thrown in the dressing room once years ago when we won a playoff game. We went mm-hmm. to Wembley. So the players dragged me down because everyone was all excited and had the flags and everything else. The only time journey after a game, yeah. I've been, I, I don't even go after a game. I see the players in preseason. I'll see the players on the training ground when I'm there during the week in my office um, when I go down. But, you know, the, that inner sanctum of the dressing room for me mm-hmm. isn't about directors or owners, it's about players and staff. That's their safe place. Yeah. I don't think the chairman owner belongs in a dressing room and shouldn't be in there. Just my personal view. How do you manage that kind of line between being the owner, uh, uh, co-owner, and you know being involved in a lot of the transfer business that you do, and keeping out of the way of football matters when it comes to you know crossing that white line? Like, how do you sure. keep those two worlds separate? It's it's easy, you know. I, you know, the players respect me. Some of them can sometimes be intimidated. It's funny even though I have relationships with them from when we've done deals. Um, I was at training ground on Saturday. I had a great chat with all the lads talking about pandemic and lockdown and mm-hmm. families, talking about about kids. I, I spoke during the pandemic to our captain on Zoom you know, when we were doing the pay deferrals. I've, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that you can come to me about anything within reason. Yeah. You know, if a player came to me to moan about the manager and not being in the team, I'll tell him to fucking do one. But if it's a personal matter yeah. or it's help, and I've had that before, I've helped players get mortgages, I've helped players buy houses. I've helped, player, I've helped players with addictions. Mm-hmm. You know, these are my employees, but they're also people I care about, and I'll do my best. You listen to ex-players, Aaron McLean, people like that talk. You know, you'll see the relationship I have with mm-hmm. players. Now, a couple of ex-players might dig me out, but they're the ones I've never ever spoken to, yeah. and they're the ones who failed. Um, but the big players will always be respectful of what I did and played a part in their careers, because you know, before us. Maybe they weren't going in the right place, and we help play a part in that. So there's mutual respect. Yeah, it's at the end of the day, it's a. Uh, I mean, it's a small business in the grand scheme of things. A football club is a relatively small business and a family business, and Big you know time. you need to take care of your employees. Um, you, you never know when you need something from someone. Yeah, and I've said this to all managers, including Grant McCann when I was training him, and he became a young manager. Don't don't ever fall out with a board. Mm-hmm. Don't ever slaughter. Some managers go out and slaughter owners and boards. And I always say, don't be fucking stupid and short-sighted because long-term you don't know when you need help. And like, for example, when Grant got with another job at Doncaster, I was in Hawaii on holiday. I helped prep him for his job interview. You know, we've got other managers' jobs by Barry and me ringing clubs and saying, look, would you, you know, employ them? You know, so if you fall out with us and go the other way, I'm not going to help. Yeah. And if someone rings me about you, I'll go down and touch them with a barge pole. It's a small so, world. Yeah, you know, you have disagreements in football and arguments, but you shouldn't have grudges. You know, and I'll stick to that forever. All right. Well, let's wrap up by going into our competition this week. So our competition, I'll tear it up while I'm getting it uh, screen shared here on the video, um, is for five hundred pounds in cash. We, Show me uh, the money. Yeah, for uh, a rating and review and to answer the question, where did you fly from between uh, from between where and uh, where before you got on your transatlantic flight? So if you uh, want to uh, give the answer for that one, we most of the folks who entered got that right. From Orlando to Miami, Miami to the UK. All right. So I have my screen shared. Let me know if you see that, Dara. 
Let's go. Yeah, let's go. 1D. 1D. So the winner this week, drum roll, is going to be 1D. Chris Ross. Chris Ross. All right. Well, congratulations, Chris. Uh, we will be in touch. And we'll. Uh, you're, you're 500 quid richer, yeah. son. Well done. Congratulations. All right. Let me stop the screen share, come back to us here. So. Dara, I want to thank you very much again for your time this week and uh, everybody else for listening in. We'll... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you forget him. Are we not running any more competitions, Philip? Well, we haven't got anything lined up unless you've got something that's been noodling away in your mind, which uh, wouldn't surprise me <laughs> uh, to, to hit everybody with this week. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to do it this week. I'm going to get creative. Mm -hmm. You're definitely going to have to tune into next week's one. We're going to run um, a proper competition with a proper price. All right. Uh, and it might be over a series of episodes. So that one today was a nice one, 500 quid. I'm sure Chris is going to enjoy the spondulis when he gets sent them. Um, and the next one we'll make bigger. So, but again, hard truth. You need to follow, subscribe, and leave comments uh, to qualify to be in this competition that we're going to do. All right. I'm intrigued. So uh, right. listen out next week. So next week's podcast will be, what is it? It's going to be, today's going out on the 12th. So next week will be the 19th. Every Wednesday, we are um, planning on posting these. So have a great week, everybody. You, Dara, have a great week. Thanks, Phil. We'll talk again next week. Take care, guys. All right. Thanks, everybody.